The law of attraction. Something that I used to believe and something that certain cult leaders teach. Most people that believe this feel like they have some kind of universal truth that nobody else has, despite it being a widely believed in thing, regardless of how flimsy of a concept it is. For the uninitiated, the law of attraction is the idea that your mind, your thoughts, your consciousness in some way creates reality. You might have heard of it as the secret. It's one of those things that's kind of thrown around as a universal truth, even though it has no real basis in fact. It's often referred to as a pseudoscience, um, and it does fit the definition of pseudoscience, although I feel, I feel like calling it pseudoscience might be a little bit too much. Even I don't even, I don't even know if we should be calling it a pseudoscience. Like, does it even, does it even fit that level of You'll see what I mean. If you're coming over from my other videos about the Teal Swan Cult and you're a former cult member yourself, you probably have a good understanding of the Law of Attraction already. As a former New Ager and a former member of the Teal Swan Cult, yes it is a cult, yes I can prove it, this Law of Attraction is something that I used to believe in. I swore by it and I even tried to convince some of my family that it was true. Um, but is it? In this video I'm going to examine some of the arguments for and against the validity of the supernatural law of attraction as a means of explanation of cause and effect and hopefully by the end of the video I'm going to have convinced you that it is a load of but we'll see. So first let's address the anecdotal evidence. A lot of people say that things happen in their lives that could have happened no other way than that they manifested them. They think of something, they want something, and then that thing comes into their life because they manifested it, because they were in alignment with it. And again, the cats are playing. That's going to be happening, that's going to happen in every video, I think. Usually people claim to manifest money, new relationships, uh, the success of a small business they're involved in, but th there really is no limit to the kind of things that people have claimed that they've been able to manifest using the law of attraction. It's a long list. So here, taking into account the burden of proof, if you're claiming that this came about in your mind first, then you need to prove that it began in your mind in some way. You need to be able to show that if you're thinking was first and then the thing, the manifestation happened after, that that whole process began in your head, in your mind, in your thoughts, feelings, whatever. If you want to be taken seriously by someone who holds logic and reason and rationality in high regard. So you often get when someone is kind of refuting a supernatural claim that the person who believes in it will say, well prove it's not true. So that's why I mentioned the burden of proof. So it makes sense that if you're someone who's saying something, a thing is true, then it falls to you to show that it's true. It shouldn't fall to someone else to show that it's not true. So if you're the one that's claiming the law of attraction is true, then the burden of proof falls firmly on you to show that it is. The problem I see in this is that the idea of determinism is kind of brushed aside. Um, and that's not to say that determinism is true or that I even believe it necessarily, but when you examine it as an idea, the law of attraction kind of almost flippantly brushes aside the possibility that all of this is determined in a way anyway. I think it's impossible to say that all of this stuff that was manifested in some way wasn't already on its way to you when you started thinking about it. I mean, if you dig down on determinism, the idea kind of lays out the notion that everything that exists now has been in some way set in motion by an unfolding of, uh, of events which began with the beginning of everything. And everything, one thing leading to another, leading to another, leading to another, brought us to here and now. Can I just say that all day the cats are asleep and the moment I sit down to make a video, this happens. Cats. So the thing with determinism is that it doesn't need the idea of thought manifested reality in order to work well. Like, it works fine as a notion, as an idea, without the idea that your thoughts create your reality. It kind of just, it kind of makes sense, right? So yeah, if you wanted to show that your manifestation, if you like, started in your head, then you'd have to be able to illustrate that there were no causal factors in play before you started thinking about it and attracting it 
to you. You'd have to show that it wasn't going to happen that way anyway, which is kind of a difficult thing to show. But in that way, you'd kind of have a leg to stand on when it comes to saying that your thoughts create your reality. That's why it's a pseudoscience, because it attempts to explain things after the fact and can't produce any reliable predictions that can be tested. Also, humans are terrible at recognising coincidence. And if you're sitting there thinking, but coincidence can't explain this wonderful thing, this amazing thing that's happened to me, I can assure you, chances are, it can. And it probably does. The thing with coincidence is that unlikely things happen all the time. And as humans, we're not prone to paying attention to everything. It's kind of just not how we are. We pay attention to some things and ignore everything else. Um, but when, we, when something happens to us, we notice something that seems to have a causal connection, we are prone to giving it meaning even though there is no causal connection. And as humans, we like to fill the gaps in our knowledge with comforting ideas and mystical tales. I'm not gonna say God here, but God. But when you start paying attention, you notice how common these so-called unlikely things actually are. Like for example, do you know how many people need to be in a room for there to be a 50-50% chance that two of them share a birthday? Go on, guess a number. I bet you're thinking of something quite high right now. You're thinking of a high number. Well, 23. 23 people need to be in a room for there to be a 50-50% chance that two of those people will share a birthday. Now, if you're in a room with some other people and it just happens to be you that shares a birthday with someone else, you might think that that means something. As I say, we like to fill in the gaps in our knowledge, in our knowledge with mystical explanations, but is literally chance. It's literally a numbers game. But that's the thing, we underestimate the rate of chance. If you want to hear the more philosophical arguments against the law of attraction, then I highly recommend the rationality rules video on the subject. So now that we're done with coincidence and chance and the burden of proof and determinism, let's move on to the claims that science in some way backs up the law of attraction. Because for every supernatural claim, there's an iffy interpretation of science to give the true believers something to chortle about. So the idea that the law of attraction has any scientific vindication whatsoever is entrenched in two oft misunderstood things in quantum physics, the observer effect and the double slit experiment. Right, I'm not going to claim that I have a full understanding or even a slightly complete understanding of either of these concepts. What I am going to do is attempt to lay out a case for how they absolutely do not prove the law of attraction. The observer effect is described by Wikipedia like this. In physics, the observer effect is the theory that the mere observation of a phenomenon inevitably changes that phenomenon. And the double slit experiment is this. The double slit experiment measured the movements of photons through two slits and turned up significant findings in the, quild, in the, quild, in the field of quantum mechanics and gave us insight into how light moves. The curious thing here is that when the experiment is observed, the measured result is different. So the way that the New Age Law of Attractionists like to tell this story is that the observer in this instance is a human. And in the film What the Bleep Do We Know, they offer a fun animation in support of their interpretation. They essentially say that when the experiment is carried out and the photons are observed by a human, then the fact that they are observed changes the results. Problem is, they're confused. They got their terms mixed up. You see, the thing is, in quantum mechanics, observer doesn't mean human person. It doesn't imply consciousness in the way that the New Agers want it to. You see, in quantum mechanics, the observer actually refers to the measurement apparatus. It refers to the machines or whatever that they're using to take the measurements. Now, one possible interpretation is a von Neumann-Wigner interpretation, which says that in order for the observation to be complete, there's a consciousness required. It says that for quantum measurement to occur, consciousness is necessary. The difficult thing here is that that's quite a tricky thing to test. How can you test that the results only change when they're observed by a conscious observer? Because every time you're looking at them, you're a conscious observer looking at them. So how can you know that they were different before you looked at them? That's my understanding of it anyway, and I may be completely off base, and if you happen to be a quantum physicist and you're watching this, please put me right. The facts are important, right? Especially when we've got people claiming that quantum physics supports this kind of nonsense. <laughs> 
I'm sure that someone someday will perhaps find a way around the von Neumann-Wigner interpretation problem, but um, yeah, at this point I don't think we have. But quantum physicists are clever and they will, I'm sure, find a way at some point, maybe, perhaps. I suppose it just it just kind of depends on how secretive these photons really are. Regardless, when the New Age Law of Attractionists are saying that when the experiment was observed the results changed, what they think they're saying is that when a conscious observer um, observed the results, they changed. But what they're really saying is when the measurement apparatus or apparatus never know how to pronounce that, observed the, uh, observed the experiment, the results changed. And, and that distinction is key, I think. Now, we can agree that that is a peculiar thing, whether it's a measurement apparatus or apparatus or a human observer, conscious observer. It's, it's a curious and interesting thing that the results changed. And it does have some interesting implications on the nature of the universe, for example. But does it prove that consciousness directly affects the results? No. Does it prove that consciousness affects or creates reality? No. Does this idea in any way extend to mind creates reality? I don't think it does. To say that when the results were observed they were different is true. But to say when the human observed the results, they were different, it's inaccurate. And it's an unfortunate semantic misunderstanding. Just like the old creationist catchphrase, evolution is just a theory, it's based on a misunderstanding of a term that we commonly use in a colloquial sense that in science is used to mean something very different. So here's the thing, even if the von Neumann-Wigner interpretation was correct, there is no way that it would necessarily even prove that your thought state or your emotional state or your intentions actually affected the outcome of the experiment at all. There's no way to say that what you were thinking, feeling or intending would actually affect the observed results in any way. So if it was correct, maybe the fact that you as a conscious observer were observing it might change the results. But what you're feeling, thinking, intending, that may, that probably, possibly, um, doesn't come into it. Doesn't come into it at all. So, <laughs> does the double slit experiment prove that mind creates reality? No, it doesn't. Based on the findings of the double slit experiment, there is absolutely no reason to assert as truth that the human mind has any capacity to influence or affect or change or create reality as a direct result of observation alone. Especially not the emotional or mental state of the person or their intentions. Still, that doesn't stop New Ages asserting it as fact. It doesn't stop them saying your mind creates your reality as if it's actually true. Hopefully this will clear up at least some of that. And that about wraps up this video. So thank you for watching. Don't forget to stick a like uh, down below. And if you found this interesting or, or whatever, then please stick a comment below. I'm sure that if you believe this at the beginning and you liked believing it, then this might have upset you a little bit or, or have provided you with some degree of cognitive dissonance. So if that is you and you're feeling particularly confident in um, what I've just hopefully outlined as being false, uh, still being true, then please, please, Hit the comments with your apologetics, although I don't think you need an invitation to do that if you're a tealer. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and you just you make sure that you click on the bell and then click all notifications because uh, YouTube needs that now um, in order to show you what I do sometimes. Um, all doesn't mean all, it means sometimes. At the moment I'm committing to uploading on Wednesdays, so if you don't see an upload from me on a Wednesday in your subscription feed or whatever, check onto my channel, it should be there. I hope that that works well, and I may also release the odd video um, in between that as well, like I've done this last week with a video on sexuality. If you haven't seen that, by the way, please go and check it out. Uh, my reach has kind of dropped on that one. Um, so, yeah, ch check that out. I'll put a link to that here, actually. I'll give you a card for that. Um, it's just a video on why I think that we should be talking about sexuality, and I talk a little bit about why I think we don't talk about it and uh, the importance of 
talking about it. As usual, if you want to get in touch with me personally one-to-one, -one, then please use my social media, my Twitter, Facebook group, Discord, all that stuff is below if you want to do that. Also, if you're an ex-member of the Teal Swan Cult and you're looking for a community of other ex-members, then I'm trying to build that, I'm trying to create that, and there's a group, there's a link to uh, my Facebook group below. If you're a current member, please just leave that alone. It's not for you. <laughs> it's not for you. And as normal, all my sources are in the description below. If you want to read up on any of the things that I've said in this video, um, all that stuff's there. And thank you for watching again, and I will see you in the next one.